Hey folks, I'm Grimwit from NatchEvil.com, and this is Natchian News. There's a lot going on, so I'll start with the good news. I'm working on the World Sin novel as a project for NaNoWriMo. 50,000 words in one month. Wish me luck. Once I get my brain in order, Natch Evil should start up again, updating on a weekly basis. I promise this will happen, and that'll be nice when it does. And finally, I've also started on a new Let's Play, Edna and Harvey, Harvey's New Eyes. This is mostly because I want my wife to experience the game, but she doesn't like adventure games. So that should be fun. Alright, the stressful news. My mother-in-law is going to the hospital tomorrow to have her kidney out, and there's the possibility of cancer. This affects me because 1. My wife and I live in her home, and 2. With the medical bills, it's likely we'll lose the house. I am uncertain what the future will bring, where we will live next year, or how I will continue updates. I think I mentioned at the beginning of this project that I would keep the updates coming until the money ran out. The money's run out. Anyway, I had planned on halting progress in the podcast in December, because it's clear my, nar- my narration is crap. If you'd like to take up narrating Whirlson Gate, send your auditions to natchevil at gmail.com. I'm still going to do these projects until they shut the power off, or I get kicked out. That said, it'll be quite obvious why this week's world send is such a downer. But with the loss of everything comes a clean slate, right? A fresh beginning? With that, here's this week's episode of World Send Gate. World Send Gate. Episode 13. Rainwash by Mike Rojas April 1921 43rd Street in Queens Galley some 30 to 40 miles north of Whirlson Gate Everything had been sold except the plague on Anthony's mind He sat in an empty house devoid of his wife his family and most of the furniture sold to feed his horrific habit. All that was left was his clothes, the chair he sat on, and the paintings that he failed to sell. Well, all that, and a number one painted on the bare wood floor in green. His hands cradled his head, and he cursed that most difficult of diseases, creativity. What what have I done, he said, while he highlighted the milestones in his mind that left a trail of his life. His hands, paint-stained, thick as blood, unwashed by the wet of his eyes, could not crush away the pain in his head nor his heart. They marked him as clear as the signs left by the demons on his doorstep. It had begun a week ago with the argument with his wife and lover, a discussion over that most common of marital stresses, cash. She left him and made way to a friend's home at the other side of Knox estate, leaving Anthony to his last two loves, the brush and the canvas. The next morning he walked, as per normal, to Granny's diner and watched the machine of the city click onwards, a clockwork society of unfeeling cogs, ignorant of Anthony's loss. The waitress poured coffee unconsciously. The cop directed traffic without seeing. The paper boy called out the headlines monotonously. Queen's Galley had the audacity to carry on without Anthony, leaving him behind for the predators to pick him off from the pack. After a modest breakfast and a return home, Anthony found his porch littered with freshly broken twigs outlining a sort of spiral. Was it a six or a nine? He kicked the sticks away, and the painter shrugged it off as some sort of exotic prank that the local children must have been playing. He had no time for such things. The light bill had stopped coming, leaving Anthony with mere candlelight to use his oils to. His jacket and hat covered the bank ledgers, and his hand whisked up the brush. The contents of his art had once been called grotesque, but Anthony couldn't be bothered to argue. His wrists, he found, spoke better than his lips when he poured the void of his chest into the blacks, blues, reds, and grays. 
There was a cooling space in his mind, like an empty pregnancy. The next morning, after a bit of egg and toast at the diner, Anthony returned to find a distinct five painted with grass stains on his door. It took him precious sunlight to scrub the number away. The next morning it was a four slapped in mud on his painting room window, casting a shadow over his easel. This was a countdown, but to what? And who could play such a perverse trick on Anthony, now that his life was decaying? Were the children so cruel? Or perhaps, more likely, was that they were part of the city, indifferent to the suffering of others? It began to rain on the number three cut into his lawn. A letter from his wife arrived, saying with no uncertainty that she was safe across the state. Safer now that she was not with him. Without sunlight, it took many candles to light the canvas. Candles, Anthony felt, he could no longer afford. He swallowed hard to look at his children. Boys and girls pushed from the womb of his hands under blank, handmade racks. It was a tickling in his brain, a bane on the back of his mind, forcing him towards his addiction. It was a responsibility to yet created abominations of his inner world that pushed his wife away, pushed his life away. The next day, he neither ate breakfast nor left his home. His eyes were held open somehow by the noise of the rain, whipping at his shutters. In such a storm as this, no child would brave to place a number on his doorstep, and even if they did, Anthony would surely hear them. Time didn't just stop. It disappeared from the properties of the universe. Anthony had long sold his watch, and the muddled light of the sun offered no distinction of the hour. Perhaps it was lunchtime when the growling of his stomach finally shouted over the stumbling raindrops and forced the man into his kitchen. When he entered, however, he collapsed at the side of the room, jaw agape and eyes wide. There, on the floor, placed without any sound at all, was a set of stones forming a two. Anthony looked down at the green one, on his painting room floor. What have I done? he asked again. What mistakes could have led me this way? His eyes turned to the note on his desk. Warped with water, it was an official letter from the bank. They no longer held trust in his payments. His love, his possessions, and now his home were lost. And for what? he screamed at the unsold paintings. For you? At what point in my life had I been stricken with this worthless responsibility? This sickness, this idea that if I did not make you, no one would. Anthony hadn't realized how close he had gotten to the unmoving pictures. The depiction of elongated faces and gray-skinned beasts. He watched the curves of female limbs piled on a platter, and the melting of teeth poured from a wine flute. Stories untold by his brush now seemed like someone else's work, not his. When the paint flowed, it was not through the brush, but through Anthony and by some unknown artist. What have I done? He collapsed on his chair, cursing all those who encouraged him to take up this addiction. Anthony wept and wailed over his newfound truth. The world fights creation. I've given my life to dead cotton and pigment, and it's all gone now. The world is rotting, the walls are crumbling and life on earth has fallen into a metallic phage. I've destroyed myself. There was a thunder somewhere behind Anthony, but he hadn't noticed. The only noise that pulled him from his abyss was the unfamiliar hiss of a machine outside. A rumble left after the storm's rolling anger maintained somewhere at the front of his house. Anthony shuffled through his front door, barely able to stand under the weight of apocalypse. The vision before him, parked on the street, seemed so absurd to him that the painter concluded it must have been a hallucination of his finally shattered mind. Only madness would bring that sight in front of his foreclosed home. After a nervous giggle left him, 
he shut the door. It stayed there for an hour. An hour and no one on the street seemed to notice. It remained running, saying putt, 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 waiting for the painter, who took his time studying the dried leaves and the compost of his life. Finally, his curiosity could bear it no longer. Anthony grabbed his hat and coat and approached the waiting blue bus. Inside made little more sense than the automobile itself. The back was black with suit and warped metal. A lone man lay slumped over the middle seats, perhaps dead, and the driver was a strange, silent woman. That alone would be proof this was a dream, but this driver had no face, only hair hung over a blood-stained collar. There's... there's nothing. I'm sorry, said Anthony. I have no fear. The driver answered by closing the doors with a hiss behind the artist. Anthony found his seat and waited. He watched the world wash away. Drops of rain on the bus window peeled away backwards, pulling the city with it. Queen's Galley had been the place of his birth, and now, after spending his entire life in the city, it was gone. Anthony's life was complete. His destination could not be more uncertain if he had died. April, 1921, Raven Love Street. Anthony had heard the rumors, of course. Everyone in Knox Estate knew about the town, but he had never seen it before. The sign on the forest road was stone and wood, and surprisingly well kept for the town's reputation. It read in large, bold letters, Welcome to Whirlson Gate, the gravestone of the world. As Anthony left the bus across the road from the wordless hotel, the rain ceased, leaving a hot fog in its wake. The shower's job was done, after all. It had finished washing away all traces of the artist's life. Now, all that was left was to watch the world rot away. A funny old man in a straw hat pulled his raincoat close as he walked past. Ex "'Excuse me. Why am I here?' Anthony asked, seeking some kind of meaning to the last week the last month, or perhaps the last twenty-seven years. Same reason we all are, I guess, answered the mayor. Hi, I'm the mayor, but most folk call me St. Peter. What's your name, Mr. Newcomer? Anthony, said the painter. Anthony Pickman. The sky was an overcast gray, almost white with the sun diffused behind it, like a blank canvas. If you like Wilson Gate or Natchian News, hit like, share, subscribe, or whatever. There's also a link in the doodly-doo if you're kind enough to donate to the cause. Every dollar will be shaped into tiny little ships for my paper ship armada. Paper ship naval battles! Music for this show was unknowingly provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. The rain sound effect was provided by Soundjay at Soundjay.com. Check below for links to Soundjay and Incompetech. I messed up. Last episode's noun was Brutus the Cleaver. This episode's noun was Rain. Leave a comment suggesting your favorite person, place, or thing from this episode, and I will include it in the next one, forming a chain of nouns. Have nothing but fun, YouTubes. Have nothing but fun.